Hey, everybody, this is Jeff Cohen, and I have a very special guest on today. I would like you all to meet Bob Schwartz. Hey, Bob, how are you? Good. Good morning, Jeff. Good to hear from you. So, Bob, you and I have known each other for a couple of years. We met uh, several years ago at a, at a trade show called Retail Global. Um, I have had the, uh, the, I guess, the honor, the privilege of kind of knowing your story. Uh, I've been a consumer of Nordstrom's for a long time. Um, can you kind of, for people that don't know you, can you talk a little bit about kind of how you grew up in this world of e-commerce and, and, you know, your serial entrepreneurship and kind of where you are today? Yeah, Jeff. Well, it's, it's funny. It was, it's like a lot of things in life. There's things that are purposeful and there's things that are accidental. The e-commerce thing is kind of a collision of both in that uh, I was on a journey trying to um, early on understanding technology, learn to code. Uh, got involved with a software company, left the financial business to get involved with a software startup because I thought they they just felt like um, smart people. And, um, and, and started to learn to code. And then, but my DNA is really as a marketer. My DNA is really, at that time, is really a direct marketer. And what I found fascinating was on Prodigy at the time, there was no internet, that you could actually put up a proposition in a Prodigy store and uh, change it immediately and get immediate feedback. And then uh, this, we were selling computers and we went on QVC and the same thing. You could, you could say something and get an immediate feedback. So that got me intrigued that uh, for the first time in direct marketing, you could create this immediate feedback loop where you'd say something and as you're speaking, you could see the results or as you're putting things up online, you could see the results at this time it was Prodigy. You could see how it, it, it uh, had an effect versus direct mail that used to be three to six month cycles of A-B right. testing. So it was really cool. You had the power there. And then the internet was born and I moved everything over towards the internet. And since then, I've been smitten with because the internet is, uh, it allowed me to you know, be a marketer, a direct marketer, in essence, tell a story, have an impact in people, and to actually have people read something or do something and take an action based on what I did without me being there, I thought was fascinating. So that got me hooked into it. And along the way, I've always looked at my career as um, a series of projects, three to about three year projects, whether I'm doing one company at a time or multiples. And uh, one of the companies I got involved with right after that original story, um, we were a couple, we were a solutions business and we had a set of technology and we turned the company inside out. And we sold that to Amazon. It was a live auction company. And that was early internet days. And then, um, and that got me, uh, Nordstrom in, interested in me. I was up in Seattle and got Nordstrom interested in me. They were trying to go online. They hadn't been online. And they hired me to launch, build, and basically scale and spin off Nordstrom.com as a separate company, which we did. And, um, and then I'd say, then there were a series of other companies, a public company down here. I was brought in to turn around down here being LA. Yeah. And, uh, then there was another little solutions company called Varian and, uh, Varian was, um, 35 people doing interesting websites and a guy named Roy Rubin, uh, who had founded it while he was in college. And he showed me kind of lifted up the covers and showed me see this little open source thing we're doing. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah, And we said, I, I met him because I needed a couple of websites built for a couple of companies I was on the board of on the East Coast. And we started talking and just built a great relationship. I joined Varian and we launched, you know, the product Magento and turned it into the company Magento and grew it from 35 people to 350 and sold it to eBay. So it's always been a series of, of projects. And now sometimes I'll do multiple companies. So right now I, you know, I've got a holding partner company and I look at it as, Hmm. more like operational capital. So it's, uh, it's my time and some of my partner's times uh, yep. affecting the growth and success of companies. Some large companies where uh, it's uh, our, our vision and goal is just to help build great companies. And, um, and uh, some are very large companies like Universal Music Group where we're just highly engaged, helping make sure they do the right things and, and have access to the right partners around the country, excuse me, around the globe and uh, build out their, their global commerce infrastructure. And some are what we call the portfolio companies that we actually own equity stakes in, like Tomando that we sold to Neopost and W Promote, which is a large digital marketing firm, and One Hope Wine, okay, which is an outlier, but a lot of fun, great founders. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I guess what's common amongst our audience and, and, and yourself is that our audience is, is entrepreneurs, right? Um, our audience is 
uh, mainly around the physical product side of selling on Amazon um, more than the uh, e-commerce side. But I think the journeys are all the same, right? The journeys of, a, of an entrepreneur in whatever business uh, that they take ultimately ends up being the same. So, uh, you know, when you give advice, right? I know you do a lot of public speaking. When you give advice, like what do you tell entrepreneurs um, that you've learned from your journey that can help them on, on their journey? Yeah, I think, you know what, Jeff, I think at the highest level, what I, uh, what I hold to be true uh, for all the success is, so most of the companies I get involved with are, I'll call, you know, they're, they're early, fast growth. Uh, they have some uh, specifics to what they are, yep. but, but I fall in love with the founder. And the reason I fall in love with the founder is because after I scratch away asking the question why a lot, I usually get to a core that's some sort of burning desire to do something a little bit different or a lot different, or they have this, this is why I started it, it was a pain point. And what happens for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially if they're, you know, you've been battle wary for years, is you start to contract and you, you start to tell a story that is incremental versus that heartfelt story from the beginning. So a lot of things is I go back to the beginning and I go back to why did you, why did we start this thing? And for Roy Rubin, it was, I just want this Magento thing to be core to all of e-commerce. And I'm like, wow, that's big. That wasn't the original, <laughs> that wasn't the original thinking. And so we had to approach the company differently. But the reason I share that with you for any entrepreneur, what's common to it for me is you have a choice. And uh, my dad taught me, um, he was in the insurance business and you're either a commodity or you're a brand. Basically you're either, you're either a bot product, right? A bot product in the insurance business is, um, is auto insurance. You buy a car, you have to go buy auto insurance. So what do you do if it's a bot product? It's a commodity purchase. So I'm looking for price feature function cause it's a bot product. I have to go buy it or I'm going to go buy it. Sold product is over here. Sold product might be life insurance, starts to be a sold product. Hey, Jeff, you just had some kids. I think you should start thinking about protecting your, your, your family and et cetera. And really it ends up being instead of commodity, it's a story product where it's a brand. So as you move from commodity towards, store, towards brand and then brand into story, uh, to me, that's the differential. And you have to be at this end or this end and you have to pick a point right and either you're going to be a great commodity seller and be a master at price and feature and function and compete with walmart amazon etc or be on their platforms but that's where you're competing and there's nuances you can add to it or you're over here and you're you're saying okay no i'm going to compete on those but this is who we are we're we this is who we are we just happen to sell these things so for nordstrom this is who we are. We're just great customer service. They change customer service across the globe, right? Yep. Uh, but we just- I remember you telling a story at a trade show about a guy who like tried to return tires after they had been uh, used for some number of years and Nordstrom's took the tires back even though they had never sold tires, right? They never, they never sold tires. And then on the internet, we had some bride and groom. They got married- I know five years prior and they had gotten smoked salmon that we had for a holiday pack at Nordstrom. And they said, all they asked is, Hey, can we return? I mean, can we eat this? Is it safe? And our call center guy just literally put on his coat and his hat and it was raining, walked down to Pike place market, bought him a new fresh pack thing and sent it to him said, I don't know here, but you know, this will work. So, but yeah, but ultimately they changed it, right? They decided that they wanted to own customer support. Um, and they changed the way customer support was done, right? Zappos took the same angle with customer support and uh, internet buying. They, they, did. They, they did. They did. And actually, uh, if you look into the heritage of Zappos and shoes, it, you know, it stemmed from Nordstrom. Uh, in fact, it's in a whole nother story, but we built at, um, at Nordstrom, one of the things I wanted to do, same thing, instead of just being seen as retailer, I wanted a point of differentiation so I built NordstromShoes.com, the world's biggest shoe store, and we taught our supply chain how to uh, pick, pack, and ship Kenneth Cole Colhan. We taught them how to direct ship a single unit, or we parked their inventory with us. And uh, it was the one thing that Nordstrom, after we spun Nordstrom out and spun it back in, they dropped that. And I think it was, you know, I think they were a little sad to drop it because they yeah. saw Zappos just take off. But I'll go back to the the the, the core of it is. 
um, my the the master advice to this is you have to pick a point and decide who you are. You, you can just be a great commodity seller. It doesn't. I'm not saying that's bad. Right. You're you're really focused on optimal price, optimal uh, inventory, and feature and function. You're and you're competing out there, and a lot of small players on Amazon can do that really well because they don't have the cost, the inherent cost of some other competitors out there. But I say still, even with that, I would move over here and always tell a story. I mean, how yeah. do you tell a story? And for over here, it might still be, if you're, just, if you're just on the commodity side, it might be, you know, we're trusted. We've been doing this a long time. So how do you, how do, you do that? And the founders I fall in love with, they're over here. They're over here saying, I got, I, I got to go do this. I got to, you know, One Hope Wine. It's all about doing good. It's a for-profit. But Jake came out of Gallo and Jake Cloberdan said, I just want to create a product. About the same time Tom Shoes took off. Yep. I just want to go create, um, uh, uh, I just want to go do good in the world. And now he's out of 10,000 wine brands. He's in the top 100 and they've done millions and millions of dollars of good. So it's that bifurcation I always, I always see and, and I look for out there. Yeah. So you kind of uh, broke it down into two things. One, you started with the what's your why, right? And it's something we always kind of uh, recommend to, to entrepreneurs as well is understand your why. And uh, what, what you kind of glossed over, which is a, a workshop exercise that can be done when you are teaching people to get to their why. It's just, it's, it's, asking the question over and over again. But why is that important? But why did you do it that way? And it kind of sounds like it can get annoying, right? Um, and people that are good at it can ask the questions to where it's not annoying. But ultimately, you get down to this because the last time I went to Mexico, I felt the need to help the people down in Mexico. So I created this company. Great. That's the reason that's why. It. That's it. That's it. That's it. And, 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 you, and you're spot on. And I, I got to make you... I got to make one correction. Yeah. I'm, I'm really good at this because I got a success track record of companies and I am annoying. So I'm good at it, but okay. I'm also annoying. You ask my founders, they hate it. They, they love it, but they hate it. Cause I just keep, and I apologize. I do apologize along the way. I go, yeah, yeah. But, but, but why? And it's not purposefully. It's just my curiosity because what happens in life is you start, you, you, that's why you start it. And it's so meaningful and yeah. that's really the differential. And then yeah. you start going and you, you change your story because, oh, I got to raise money. And yeah. the last guy I talked to said he's more interested in my, this part of the story. And you start, to, you start to create mud out of it. And to bring it back here, all that is good. The thing you did for your checklist of what I need to do to build a great company. But the differential is lost. And that differential is what makes you, takes you from just being a company or a business into being something that's successful. Right? Yeah. And for and Amazon sellers, it could be that you wanted to raise, uh, you wanted to start making $5,000 a month so that your wife could stop working. That was That's your it. why. That's it. But, and it doesn't have to build into your story, right? You nope. can still build your story in, in other ways, but you have to know what that why is because that why does, dr does ultimately drive you. And we've seen it with digitally native brands when they've been able to build stories around their brand. I mean, everyone in our audience knows we talk about Death Wish Coffee a lot, that we're good friends with the owners. And they differentiated by being a coffee that was geared towards high caffeinated individuals. And it's, and it's all built around the brand of Death Wish. And people engage with the brand as much as they engage with a cup of coffee. Yeah, right, right. So, yeah, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And that, that's it. And like you say, even the guy who, who started the business because he wanted his wife to be able to, uh, to retire or not work therein is is the heart and the mission to it and that'll that yeah. keeps you going and innovating but it's also in there's an interesting way you can tell that story to your to your customer and client and to the extent that you can tell that story and give your brand life yep then you've hit it so I always this differentiates I, I, you in the marketplace from the other commodity sellers. It does. It does. A lot of people and a lot of people, maybe you've heard me talk about this. A lot of people say, hey, I've got a brand. I'm like, well, Jim's, you know, Jim's, uh, microphone.com is not a brand. It's a name. Yeah. I said, it becomes a brand when it has life. When you say that name 
in your to somebody and their heart starts to race, their hands get sweaty or they get excited. I mean, you say Costco and you start like, ah, it's right. great. So it I doesn't have samples. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go buy pallets of toilet paper. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you say, some, and, and we say that in the digital world, we say that that's where people are searching for you. You've gone beyond being searched for as a commodity product and you're being searched for as awesome. a branded buy that's was awesome. a great example of this. Right. Um, People, people start like if if you're looking at um, at at brand based search, then you have a brand. If people are finding you through the product name that you have, if you've created an affinity to that, uh, then then you know you've you've kind of you've won. We'll say you've won. Otherwise, you're still building up to that. But ultimately, right. that's what you're trying to build up to because that's where the affinity is going to come, uh, and it's going to make your generic product that everybody else has. Everybody has a piece of luggage, but you know, uh, to me has a nicer piece of luggage and people who travel like, um, you know, like their nicer luggage. And so yep. they'll go out and they'll seek that. That's they're, they're, exactly it. That's exactly it. So I have a question. I have a question. Um, you've started a lot of businesses, been involved in a lot of growing businesses. One of the things we talk with entrepreneurs about a lot is like, how do you get out of the day to day? Um, one of the challenges I've seen as, a, as an entrepreneur is that as our business has grown, we've had many successes along the way and we thank our customers for those. But it's harder and harder for me to get out of the day-to-day -day stuff that I was doing so I can focus on the big strategy stuff. So as an entrepreneur, um, how do you either coach your CEOs for that or, or do it yourself to keep yourself out of the minutia? Um, and, and what type of advice do you have on that? Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's hard. I mean, you nailed something that's really hard because, uh, you know, we just talked about your entrepreneurs and your, your company owners getting out of the short cycle of commodity, sell, 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 and step back and ask why, go back, understand what that is. And that's even that is takes some time. And you're like, how can I do that? I have all the fires to put out. Yep. I think what you, what you, number one, what you realize is all those fires generally get managed, generally get managed. If you had double the capacity, you're going to have double the fires. It just, it's just, you know, you'll start taking on that. And, and our body, I believe our body and our, our mental, um, our minds start to kind of be addicted to, to that. And we, we, we start to grow into that pattern about, and it's a sense of urgency, email, everything makes everything a sense of urgency, email and text. So I think it's hard. And those are the reasons it's hard. So the one trick that I do is um, uh, I've allocated, I started doing this, I think as we were building Magento uh, and it started, we, you know, we're growing so fast. There's so many things that we were leaving on the, uh, on the table that we couldn't get to that were big. And, and if I could only spend a little bit more time, that said, we had to go after the biggest things because that was right. the most important. How do we go after the biggest things? And so what I would do is on my calendar, I would isolate a Friday or a Thursday. And there's two versions of this, but I would isolate a Friday. And uh, I would just say, I'm going to work differently on that Friday. And what that meant to me is I, every, throughout the week, I started to put stuff into Friday, the stuff I wanted to read, the stuff I, and that I would naturally read anyway, the stuff that, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I wanted to answer later and et cetera. And I wouldn't go into the office. I'd go to a coffee shop and flip open my laptop and just start grinding away at that and just think, think differently. Cause you're starting to, you're getting out of the fire and you're just thinking differently. And I say there's two versions of that doesn't have to be a whole day. The other way to do it is you just, you take three hours on Friday or Thursday and you just allocate it and you just make that your time and you put stuff into it if you want that you think I should do that during that period of time and you try to protect it. That said, if you got to break it, you can break it too. But that way, you know, when you're doing it, if I asked any of your founders or your entrepreneurs, hey, is three hours a week or four hours a week too much time for that? They're going to say no. Right. What happens is you shifting. It's the, it's the hard part is shifting gears. And then when you're doing it, not feeling guilty. But if you stood right. back and go, I've got a bucket of three hours for that. And, that's, yeah. and I'm going to get away. I got to get out of the noise. And for three, four hours, I'm going to get the hell out of the noise. And I'm going to go work on these things and just think differently. It'll settle me down. Yeah, I, I, you know, for myself, what I found was that I was letting um, email dictate my schedule for the day. Ugh. 
Um, yeah, the, the classic mistake that. of starting at the top of the email and working your way down. And so I did, I did one, I did two things. One, um, I started organizing my night by day, the night before. Um, uh. and so my morning was always, my morning is always preset as to what I'm going to do and in what order I'm going to do it. Cause that's where I'm most productive, right? After about lunchtime, my productivity drops off by three o'clock when my kids get home, my productivity is gone. Um, so I get my most productive toughest stuff done in the morning. And then I get to my email. I, if you get email communication with me, most of my emails occur at night. I mean, that's back mm. at like nine, 10 o'clock at night after my kids go to bed, I'm down there banging out so, the emails. So do you just not load them? Do you just not let them run? So um, I use a tool called Boomerang. Mm -hmm. um, and Boomerang actually has a pause function. Mm -hmm. um, so I can actually like pause my inbox. Um, but I've also found patterns. So yeah. I know that like between six and seven in the morning, it's all spam. And then, um, and then between like eight and 10, it's all spam again. Yeah. After 10 o'clock, my emails that come in are actually like communication emails. Yeah. So I hired a VA to come into my inbox in the morning and organize all of my, um, my I'll call it spam, but the, the hundred or so messages I wake up to every morning that don't require any of my attention and to organize my time. I learned it all from, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, uh, an old, I'm not gonna, he called me, I just called him old, he's gonna be mad. Um, a guy who's been around this industry for a long time, his name's Perry Marshall. And he, he took some of the concepts of the four hour work week and brought it into uh, uh, the Koch 80-20 rule. So I, I use like the 80-20 rule when managing my email. I focus on the 20% of the emails that will get me the greatest amount of effort. So that's, that's great. Yeah, so it's, I think, I think the, uh, to boil it down, it's methodology, right? So have a methodology yeah. um, that works for you that allows you to focus on what's yeah. most important yeah. to you and your yeah. business um, and then stick to it. And, and ju just so I'm clear on that, so, you, you know, the audience isn't thinking and you're not thinking, hey, of course, you, you know, you've, you, you've matured to a point where you either have a company with staff and talent, et cetera, so I don't have as many fires or I'm, you know, I'm, right. I got the portfolio approach. Truth of the matter is I show up on those days, usually opening up my laptop somewhere between 6 and 6.30 in the morning because yeah. of what you said. I'm really, I know I'm really effective. And a lot of times I don't, cl <laughs> I close down the coffee shops or I, I have to move to another one and I'm not done till 4.30 or 5. Uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's generally a full day when I go after that right. and it's, it's there for work. It's not, uh, it, it, but it's just, your mind just works differently. So it is yeah, a methodology. You, just, you, break up, you broke up your routine and by breaking up your that's routine, it. you're thinking differently. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk to you about uh, trade shows. Um, we met at a trade show. Um, I felt very lucky. Uh, that trade show was, it was the first year of the trade show. And um, I think I had like a 30 minute conversation with you in the hallway. And like, I considered, you know, I was like, holy crap. Like I just talked to like the founder of Nordstrom's. My wife is going to be so excited. Um, Nordstrom's online. Yeah. And, um, you know, you've been to a lot of trade shows, uh, you host trade shows, you're hosting, uh, emceeing the uh, retail global conference here in a couple of weeks. W what do you find is the value of trade shows? How do people, how do you get the most out of trade shows? How do you recommend people get the most out of trade shows? Hmm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> there's so much to that. Okay. Actually, let me, uh, let me just make a little note on that too. Um, uh, well, first, um, there's, there, there's two things. There's the tactical part, and then there's, uh, I'll call it strategic. Why are you there? The tactical part, I'm going to start, you know. So Back w to the why questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just who I am. I can't stop it. So at the tactical level, it, you know, effective, quote, effectiveness at trade show, there was before I had W promote as one of, uh, you know, my portfolio companies and, and the three Mike founders as kind of entrepreneur founders that I was coaching, mentoring, and working with. Um, I used to see them at shows, great people. Great, and they had, I don't know, at that time, maybe 35, 50 people. And, uh, you know, now they're 350. But it, um, they, they, they were fantastic. Great at, at shows and booths. But I always would walk by their booth and kid them. I'm like, you see that you're lying on the booth? You, you don't have to stay in there. You, you, you can get out there and meet people. Go. In fact, I would take you two and I'd send you both in different directions. I used to, and even at Magento, I used to get, I used to, 
some of our, you know, our partner managers would uh, talk about, hey, you know, one of our solution partners wants to take us, uh, take a couple of us off to uh, a, a golf or off to a game. I'm like, or a couple of my team would be walking around together. I'm like, this is a target rich environment. This is like going to a fish farm, right? Where my kids used to drop a line in and it was like piranha trying to eat the line. Yeah. Why would, why would you go off site? Why would you leave? Why aren't you here? Just, and it's not about business. It's like, and I'm Jeff, you know me, you, you, we, we've yeah. interacted before. I love our industry. I actually am, you probably know, I'm one of the last guys to leave shows and it's not like I'm drinking and having a good time. I love the energy of the people. We're all entrepreneurs, even if you're working for a company. So number one, tactically get out there and just meet people, say hi to them. It's amazing. The other thing at a higher level, strategic level, you know, why go to trade shows and why go to some of these conferences? Um, I use this method called first dollar marketing, right? And sometimes you'll hire a, you know, a, a VP of marketing or a head of marketing or a CMO and you'll say, hey, what's it going to take? And they'll go, well, what's the budget? I've got, okay, let's say I've got a million dollars or whatever it is uh, to spend. Uh, over the next year, or $100,000. And they'll say, well, we're going to do a little PR. We're going to do a little of this. We're going to do a little of that. And they'll spread it out. And I'm like, yes, that's great. But you're a fast growth company. You can't think that way. I said, maybe ultimately, but here's the way I want you to think. It's called first dollar marketing. If you only had $10,000 or $100,000, where is that? Where would you spend it to get the biggest bang for the buck? Where would you first spend that first $100,000 or $10,000? And most of the time, it's where it falls into field marketing. It's going to live events, meeting people. Uh, because, you know, you can go away from one event with, you know, I'll say a minimum, three, five really valuable interactions that can lead to something. And then I'll ask, where's the next 10,000 or 100,000 being spent. And it, you know what? It, it doesn't mean it's a different place. It also could be field marketing. And, and until you feel like you've optimized wherever you think that first dollar goes, then you ask, where's, where's, where does the second dollar go? And third, and then you start to pile up. And some, somewhere along the way, you're like, okay, we've optimized field marketing, but it is where our first dollars go, right? And yeah. I, and, 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 yeah. Seller, and sellers on the Amazon platform might say, well, yeah, but I don't have field marketing. But I think the it's the piece for them to understand is that like when you get into a room with like-minded individuals who are trying to succeed in the same way that you're trying to succeed, the things that come out of that are, it, it's like you just said, like go to the coffee shop and think differently for the day. That's what a trade show is about. It's about going to the coffee shop and thinking differently. It's coming in and, um, you know, I, I have no, um, I've been to some trade shows where I don't see a single presenter speak. Now, I'm a presenter, you're a presenter, neither of us want to hear that. But the, the value of a trade show, I think, is in two parts. One is the presentation and the content that's being given, right? Is it, is it something that's meaningful to you? Are, you? are you getting something that's going to help you with your business? Two, are they going to have um, people there, I like to say people there that will level you up. So I don't want to go to a trade show where I'm the smartest person in the room. I want to go to a trade show where I'm around other smart people that I'm going to be able to give and get. And ultimately, I don't know your attitude. I go to a trade show with the idea that I'm going there to give. So when people say like, well, what category do you sell and what products do you sell? I don't keep it all hush hush. You know, if I give, I'm going to get, because as soon as you start to take down those barriers, as soon as you start to, um, break that down the information that you get when you get invited to dinner with somebody that you just met or you get to a one-on-one -on -one conversation is literally game changing for your business it could be a, like you said it could be a new partner it could be a new supplier it could be a, a new way to inspect your products to import your products it could be a whole bunch of different things around the spectrum of all the work that you have to do as a as, a, as an e-commerce seller but um, it may not even be the, the problem that you're trying to solve when you go there. Um, and so that's where I think the value is. Um, and I, I attend a lot of them and I find value from a marketing side of myself and of our company. I find value in every show that I go to. And I would say that most sellers to get the return on investment from a trade show need one thing. Because if you get that one thing and you implement it, you should be able to make a couple thousand dollars, which is what you spent. Okay. So, so you just, that last sentence, 
goes back to uh, I get yeah I get the difference between uh, the Amazon and uh, small independent seller or small yeah. business and um, and what I'm talking about. But your your last statement nailed it exactly, which is it's an ROI. So in both cases, it's a marketing. It's to me, it's a marketing spend. Whether you're spending your own money, you're spending your own time. You need to where if you said hey on marketing aside from doing kind of the SEO SEM and some of the you know some of the some of the social, some of the different spends on that. Where, where can we, I spend the most, uh, where would I spend the first dollar on strategic, on strategic? And for, if you're a entrepreneur of one or small business, these shows are fantastic. I mean, it's how you build and you build a reputation and you learn and you build a network. I mean, it's the reason I'm doing, um, uh, retail global is I met, uh, Phil at, uh, in Australia as I was helping Tamando, one of the companies there, and I went to, um, he asked me to speak at one of his events, and I fell in love with what he's doing and the way he approaches events, very much like I did at Magento. It feels more like a family versus a trade show. And I built that really, you know, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have that relationship with Phil. Right. And through Phil, I've met a ton of other Australian companies and companies here in the United States at his um at his at his different shows but it was through that that trade show i mean that's just one little piece where yeah. you know it's spot on from what we're talking about and, and a lot of times you can uh you can you can drill back that something that's occurring today that led from a relationship and 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 one of the things i like to remind people of is like we're a lot of people in this business is don't have big offices and big teams and things like that and so you need trade shows to like interact with other people and see what's going on in the industry and talk shop and things like that so it's just something to think about so it is and it, it, like again uh you know maybe uh uh what i have found is is people at, at the end of the day is the biggest equation to your success and whether they're your own team or it's people you've met and it's 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 amazing you i always come back in fact here's a one of the tricks i do i mean people are writing on the back of cards and things yeah. like that i just i always keep a it's either uh, you know on my phone it's either in notes or it's in um in todoist or one of the things i i create a you know for internet retailer or for retail global or whatever whatever i'm um wherever i'm at i just create it and i just start creating you know little action that you know met jeff follow up with this and yep. instead of it's really hard on the cards i mean that's yeah, just then you got to go back and you and you smudge them yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> it's brutal so, so I'll give it, you, yeah yeah i was gonna say i'll give you my my tip um I'll take it as a speaker right um if somebody walks up to you as a speaker and says hey can i buy you a drink what do you say uh <laughs> i don't know what i say you typically say yeah right like uh, hey yeah. can I, Right. If somebody comes up to you and says, "Hey, can I buy you a drink at the bar and pick your brain?" You're not going to say no and walk out the room. You, uh -huh. you'll, you'll interact. And the same thing happens with lunch. You'll be amazed at how many speakers will sit at lunch by themselves. Oh yeah, I agree. And the tip here's the tip. Do you know the best time to find a speaker? Before he speaks. Oh yeah. Yo, geez. Oh, you are so right. Yeah. So if you do your research before you go to a show and you understand who you want to target and who you want to talk to, um find them beforehand because nobody will be interacting with them and you'll have a chance to kind of pick their brain a lot deeper um, than you will after they speak because after they speak they're going to be mobbed with people and they're going to be a little bit busier throughout the rest of the show um, yeah. I like to joke you're never popular as a, as a speaker until you've actually spoke on, spoke on stage that's great so a couple hey. couple tips there's the other, there's the other thing of hey I don't like to shake I don't like to meet people I'm uncomfortable it's hard and and actually as much as of an outward person I am I'm outward once I get to know you once I yeah. get to know the you know the audience and the crew but I'm not, eh, it's a little uncomfortable at uh, Imagine the Magento show we did we had um, we created uh, I think on our first or second one we created a master theme for it right and it was what's your story and I thought. Um, it was the most marvelous uh, tagline. And what I said on stage there is, as MC and host and, and President Magento is I said, hey, I want you as you're walking around, put out your hand and just say, just introduce yourself and say, hey, what, what's your story? And they may, what do you mean? Well, tell me about your business. Tell me about something. It's better than, hey, how are you? Or, hey, I see you're with, uh, you know, jeffcone.com. Right. And, uh, but just say, hey, what's your story? Because remember, Jeff, it goes back to what you and I said. 
it's kind of starting to get back to the why and people are passionate about talking about why they did those things or why they're in the business. Right? Yeah. So and ultimately a, you know, people like talking about themselves more than they like hearing you talk about yourself. So by yeah, asking so, them a question, let me finish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, talking, about, talking about myself. See, see yeah. how that works. Well, um, thank you, Bob, uh, Bob Schwartz. Um, I appreciate you coming on, sharing uh, some tips and some advice and some suggestions for people. I think that uh, there's a lot of great nuggets we dropped in this and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at the Retail Global Show in a couple of weeks and uh, continuing our conversations and friendship. It'll be great, Jeff, and I look forward to it. And uh, can I buy you a drink? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, take care. Take care.